Welcome, everybody. Good morning. Um, thank you, Peter, for the invitation. It's a, it's a true honor to speak to such an amazing audience in such a big room. So if you feel you don't see the slides, come closer. I, I don't know how you can see the slides all the way back there. So what I'm going to talk today in, in my talk is how to combine machine learning and control to achieve safe, high-performance um, behavior of robots. And I want to make a focus on practical learning algorithms, and I talk about what I mean by that later, um, that ultimately enhance the capabilities of robots. But I'm sure everyone in this room um, thinks about how we can enhance the capabilities of robots. So I should probably be a bit more specific. So we focus on learning actions. So if you think about the typical perception action loop in robotics, we take the output of a perception system and then decide about what are the best next actions. And we learn about that. And for the purpose of this talk, I focus mostly on trajectory tracking tasks, so a robot that needs to drive along a path or fly um, in the 3D space. We also focus on real robots. So a lot of learning in robotics is done um, in simulation environments. And a big focus of my work has been on real robots. And so here you see a few of the platforms. So on the bottom right, for example, in 11-meter wingspan hy hybrid aircraft and small um, swarms of nano quadrotors, as well as various off-road and on-road vehicles. And just as a side note, we recently won one of the more recent self-driving car competitions um, sponsored by General Motors. Um, with eight North American teams. And finally, um, we care about performance, of course, but we also care about safety. So one major limitation that has held back learning algorithms to be applied in real robotic systems is that it's not clear if they always perform uh, well and if during the learning process um, they may not you know, um, cause crashes in some form. So what is the motivation for all this? I mean, if, I could, if we could live without learning, um, that would be perfect. I would, you know, whenever we can do a task with a robot without using learning, we'll do it. It's much easier. Um, but the motivation is that classical control and planning algorithms are limited by our understanding of the system behavior and the environment. And so a typical approach is we use mathematical models to describe the robot behavior. Um, in the environment and then design control laws based on that. And this can be quite difficult. I mean, if you just look at this image where a robot drives in the snow, uh, it's hard to kind of a priori find mathematical models for that. But from my personal story, um, there are some other examples where we just couldn't get something to work um, using classical techniques. And one of these examples is this one. We tried to fly uh, a really fast slalom maneuver with a robot. And in our simulation, that worked perfectly. But in the real world, it did not, because we neglected some of the complicated and not well understood aerodynamic effects that happen if you fly at high speeds. And this is similar if you wanted to do triple flips with a multi-rotor, where it should come back to the position where it started, but it did not. And again, we use the model-based approach for that. Similar ground robots that drive at higher speeds in off-road terrain may get off the path. And we couldn't get to this vehicle to drive as fast as we wanted based on the models we had. And so classical control algorithms are limited by our understanding. But these examples that I just showed are just kind of little academic examples. But there's a broader motivation behind that work. And that is the trend that we hope that robots will you know, leave the industrial environments and also operate in, in our world, um, collaborate with us, interact with us. And these kind of applications that you see on the right um, it's hard to imagine that we will find a priori the right models and the right tools to make them work in all conditions. And so that's kind of the broader motivation to 
use learning and adaptation to achieve safety and performance in those ro next generation robotics applications where the environment is very uncertain and unpredictable. So, what kind of algorithms are we looking for? So there's a specific focus on data efficiency because whenever we ro move a robot, that costs money. And um, if you can do learning in a data efficient way, that's great. And if you could generalize knowledge between robots, even better. The algorithms ideally should learn online because as the robot explores a new environment, it gathers relevant information that we would like to use. Um, we are looking for algorithms that are safety or risk aware, and what I mean by that is that the robot knows what it doesn't know um, and is careful in those situations. And then we always, always test on real robots just because it's hard to know what assumptions are valid. And so that's kind of what I understand, I mean, if I talk about practical learning algorithms. So if we want to achieve these practical learning algorithms, how do we do that? So in, in the talk, you will see some of the approaches that we have taken leverage as much prior knowledge as we have about the system. And this may come from some physics models. Uh, really clever about the system architecture, um, where to place the learning, what are the inputs and outputs of the learning module. And we, in our specific work, we use control theoretic insights to guide us there. And then we use what I call introspection, so some ideas around how does a robot know what it hasn't yet learned. And so the tools that we use for that are probabilistic learning models. So I'd like to take you kind of on a trajectory um, of what we have explored, just to give you a sense of where we are coming from and what the ideas behind some of the work is. So whenever you have enough sufficient prior model information, you know, use model-based approaches, don't do learning. Um, then some of the first work with some of the examples I showed you, such as the slalom, we try to learn a single task through repetition. And then as we go on, we ask questions, can a robot learn any time and use, learn a model such that it can leverage knowledge from one task to do another task better, so multitask learning. Um, can robots share information um, to make the learning even more efficient? And can we kind of guarantee safety during the learning process if a robot learns online? So I kind of go through some of these ideas, and I hope you get a sense how we use prior knowledge, um, the right system architecture for the problem, and introspection to kind of do some of these tasks. So let's start with single task learning through repetition. So here the goal is to follow a desired trajectory. And our approach um, looks at a system, as you see um, in the block diagram. So the first thing you should notice, we close the feedback loop. Um, so we find a stabilizing controller. It might not be the best one, but we, we close the feedback loop such that the system is at least stable. And then we make some assumptions. We want to follow a desired output trajectory. We assume we have an approximate model of this closed loop system, which very often you may have. I mean, it's a robot you designed, so you have some knowledge about it. And we may have some kind of parameterized control strategy that adapts the reference trajectory. And so the, the simple idea here is try that control strategy, which may be coming from models, with some set of parameters. See what the output is. Um, see what this output is and see the output error. And then use this approximate model to tell you how to, in which direction to correct the parameters to compensate for the output error you saw. So it's, it's kind of a model-based gradient. But because of that, it, um, the learning can be very efficient. And so here are some examples where the um, quadrilateral learns this triple flip over time. And the goal is that it comes back to the position where it started. You see. Um, after 11 iterations, it gets 
getting closer and with 15 iteration, it's already doing pretty well at this complicated task. And then it, it converged uh, after 15 iteration. And similarly for the slalom I showed you, after three practice runs, it can actually do this slalom. So what did we learn from this? We closed the loop such that we only modify the reference signal, and as long as the reference signal stays bounded, we do not have to, um, we do not, not ever jeopardize stability. And that's important for flying vehicles, so they keep at least, stay, they stay in the air. And we use a model-based gradient, which very often you, um, a simple model can give you at least the right direction to correct, and that can make learning really efficient. So very often you can converge to a really good result in three or to five iterations, which is quite different to some other learning methods that take hundreds of iterations. We did some extensions to formation control and periodic motions, but there's fundamental limitations about this approach. First, there's no formal safety guarantees, meaning for this um, triple flip, we couldn't constrain that the vehicle stays in a um, box in the space. Um, so state constraints, basically. Um, and each new task must be learned through repetition by each new robot, which is also not ideal. So for that, we looked at how can we learn possibly a model and um, learn that model once and do to then arbitrary trajectories. And this is a more recent work where we aim to do high precision impromptu, which means no new tr training based on the new task, impromptu tracking of arbitrary traje trajectories. And we use a similar setup as you saw before. And from there we know from control theory with this setup, perfect tracking of arbitrary tra trajectories cannot be achieved. But we also know from control theory, we can put a system inverse in, in front. And um, if that is perfect, the system inverse, then we can get a one-to-one -one map to the desired um, output and the actual output match for any arbitrary trajectory. But the problem is obtaining this inverse model is very difficult um, in practice because because ultimately you rely on cancellation of dynamics, which is not um, easy and may cause instabilities. And especially if this underlying feedback control system is non-minimum phase, then this inverse is actually unstable. So, and then this whole approach is not trivial. So we tried and learn an approximate inverse of this closed loop system from input output data. And we use a deep neural network here, but any nonlinear regression technique would work. Um, and we again consult control theory about what are the inputs and outputs of this um, learning module. And actually, we first did this work without consulting control theory, so I show you kind of the, the later result. So if this underlying system, even if we don't know it, has a standard kind of linear or nonlinear structure, then we would know that this U of T is a function of the state and the desired trajectory are steps ahead. And so even if we don't know the system, the control theory at least tells us what could be good inputs to this learning module. And so choosing those inputs um, is actually, I mean, it, it's a low number of, of, of values. And R here is what is called the relative degree. It's an inherent delay. So it um, is the number of time steps it takes between applying an input to this um, reference system and seeing the output, seeing the change in the output. And so that's something that you can easily identify just by, by for example, a step response. So when we did this analysis, which is you know, quite trivial, um, we could actually significantly reduce the inputs that we used 
before for our deep neural networks. Before we, in our ICRA work, we kind of, by trial and error, try to find those inputs and got pretty good results. But with this analysis, we reduced the number of inputs by two-thirds while keeping the same performance, which ultimately redu um, reduces the amount of data you need. And so here is a result of how we tested this. So if you come to the lab, you can draw uh, something on a tablet. And so here you see our standard controller, which doesn't do very well. And if you just use this add-on block, which you could add to any black box feedback control system, it significantly improves the performance by about 50% on average. And so people, we did quite a lot of studies where just people from the lab came and drew trajectories, and then we tested the learned deep neural network. The important thing to notice is we learned this deep neural network based on um, 30 minutes of periodic trajectories and didn't change it for any of this. So it's a one learned block that we don't change anymore. So from that, what we saw is, I mean, it's an add-on block that you basically can add to any black box control system very easily, and you learn something that's task independent. And um, control theory can nicely guide us, at least in the right direction, in terms of what inputs to choose um, and how to be data efficient. The limitations was we learn this um, block offline, and then we don't do real-time updates with the drawn trajectories, which could be very useful, because our training is only on periodic motions right now. Um, it also has this, still the same problem of safety guarantees, and each robot still needs to learn on its own. So we looked at how can we um, extend that. And so how can robots l share knowledge? It's basically an extension to all what you saw before, but the result that we see is we can use learning data from robot one that has learned task A to improve task B on robot two. And so how does that work? It sounds a little bit crazy, but basically it relies on a lot of things that you've seen. So we use an underlying adaptive controller that makes the system behave like a reference model, which you usually choose to be linear. And then we can use our previous learning techniques to adapt the reference input to achieve a perfect tracking. And we extend, if we extend this now to multi-robot transfer learning, you basically use the same L1 adaptive controller with the same reference model on a different system. But this orange box in both cases has the si roughly the same input-output behavior. And if it does, then you could just transfer that reference trajectory that you learned on one robot on the other and achieve the same performance. And that's what you can see in data. So we can learn a task on the AR drone. It improves over iterations, converges. If we then take that learned knowledge to go on a Bebop that has the same underlying adaptive controller, it doesn't have to relearn, which you see in the green line, where other underlying controllers would require relearning. And then, because this orange box has a nice input-output behavior, we can do some, something similar to what I showed you with the deep neural network and learn this input-output behavior. And once we learn that, we can do multitask transfer. So it's kind of a combination of some algorithms, but what it allows us to do is if a single trajectory is learned on an AR drone, and then we use that to do a task on the Bebop that is different, and both have this underlying L1 adaptive controller, then we can do basically the following, that the AR drone do, does a task, and then we transfer it to six other tasks on the Bebop. And we can do this with kind of all different ones. And if you do this, then you get a plot like this, where the white-filled dots are without any learning and transfer. Um, the red-filled dots is if the Bebop would learn each of these tasks separately. And these box plots show the statistics of the transfer from any of the six tasks. And you see, you get very close to what to what the red filled dots are. So basically, the transfer is very efficient, and the system cannot much improve beyond the transfer if it would continue learning on its own. 
So, quick summary, multi-robot transfer, we achieve that by a fast underlying adaptive controller and then multi-task transfer by um, basically identifying this model. And from 20 seconds of data, we can achieve any trajectory on any robot with some limitations um, quite easily. So that's quite nice. Finally, how do we incorporate those safety guarantees? And so this is a large part of our current ongo ongoing work. So if you are interested in that, um, we have a number of papers in this area. Most, more recently, I just want to give the high-level idea. So what we mean by safety guarantees is, for example, if a robot does this outdoor path, um, it needs to pass through fence open openings, dense vegetation, and as we learn to drive this path faster, um, we still want to stick close to the path to not um, cause any um, collisions. The idea for this is we use a probabilistic learning model. So we model it basically the system dynamics as an a priori model plus a model that we learn. And this model that we learn has kind of uncertainty bounds. So initially these are large and we just assume the true function is somewhere between those uncertainty bounds. And as we get more data, these uncertainty bounds shrink. And so we use a Gaussian process right now to do that. So it could look like this. So initially we don't know anything about this unknown function and the function just lies within those blue and with in the blue envelope. Um, and then as we gather data, this blue envelope shrinks. And now we just need to have a controller that can take this uncertain model and control it properly. And for that, we use robust control. Um, and one approach that we did is we combine basically this Gaussian process with a model predictive control approach which has nice features about it makes decisions based on predictions about the future. And here we really do in real time update the Gaussian process whenever we get new data and then update the controller. And so the example that I show in the video looks like this. So the idea is that if you know where the robot is right now, you want to optimize its performance over the next um, X seconds. And so if you take an input sequence, and you have an uncertain model, you don't know where you end up. So that's the orange envelope. So you don't know where the robot will be. And if this orange envelope um, um, doesn't stay within the path bounds, what the algorithm does is it would reduce the velocity such that over this prediction horizon, the robot stays within the path bounds. And so as you learn and you reduce the uncertainty, you eventually can try faster because over the prediction horizon that the robot kind of makes its decisions, um, you, you can stay within the path bounds more easily. And so that, that is what this robot, this video shows. On the left is kind of the first time the robot does this outdoor run. And on the right, you see it when it's doing it the third time and you see this uncertainty loop envelope has, has decreased and the robot can drive significantly faster. and finish this particular task um, earlier than the other one. So this is a first approach. I don't think this is the best. There, there's lots more to do, but there, is pos pos there are possibilities how we can prove um, high probability safety guarantees for robots and incorporate real-time learning. We have a number of extensions. So if you are interested, you can um, visit them, but for example, also, um, extending this to robot manipulators and safe reinforcement learning in a broader, broader sense. Overall, what I wanted to show with this talk is how we can design practical learning algorithms that you know, we test on real robots in the real world and that enhance capabilities of the mobile robots. So for example, the slalom raising or driving this mobile robot in the outdoor terrain at this speed, we have had not done with any model-based techniques before. And I highlighted that data efficiency is important as well as ideally we want these algorithms to be safety aware. 
and run online. And the approach that we have taken is use as much prior knowledge as you have, be clever about the system architecture to place the learning where, you know, for example, doesn't, is not able to destabilize the system and use introspection, so enable the robot to know what it doesn't know. But if you go home from this talk, I'd like you to think about two things. So if you do learning, I'd like to, uh, for robotics, I'd like you to uh, think about, are you actually incorporating anything or, and everything that you know about the system in your learning approach? Because usually we know quite a lot of, about robotics. I mean, we design those systems. So are you incorporating this knowledge and could you incorporate it to make the learning more data efficient and safe? And if you don't do learning, think about your approaches that you are using and ask yourself, is there any systematic or repeated error that you see over and over again? Because if yes, then there may be some simple ways where you can incorporate learning um, to improve the performance. So this was a kind of brief overview where we are coming from and how we combine controls with machine learning. It's, of course, due to an amazing team of students um, at the University of Toronto and also outstanding collaborators um, that helped on the vision and the machine learning side. Thanks. Thank you very much. I'm afraid we've gone over time and we need to reconfigure for the award talks which are in here. Angela, if you're happy to take questions, people can come up and, and sure. talk to Angela one-on-one. -on -one. It's probably going to be more productive than trying to do the running microphone thing. So please join me again and thank Angela for a wonderful talk. Thank Thanks. you.